Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the Indusoft Web Studio Robotics uh, webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is John Dunlap, and I'm with Indusoft. Today we're pleased to be joined by our, our very special guest, Mr. Samir Patel, who is the Director of Product and Advanced Engineering at Kawasaki Robots, based in Wixom, Michigan. Before I get started, though, I'd like to remind everyone that we cannot hear any questions that you have. So whether you're connected to a phone to listen in or to a, a headset, um, we cannot hear you. Instead, uh, please type any questions that you have either into the chat dialog box or the QA panel dialog box, and we will answer those questions at the end of this presentation. Okay, so today's agenda, what we're going to do is uh, talk a little bit about the robotics market the, uh, uh, that are primarily used in industrial automation. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the different type of robots that are used in industrial automation, touch on some of the new technologies that are used in, with these robots. And then I'm going to pass the presentation over to Samir, and he's going to give you an overview of robotics uses that Kawasaki has been involved with, and uh, I, there's a lot of, from the presentation this morning, a lot of very impressive uses. And finally, I'm going to show you uh, how Indusoft connects in to the Kawasaki controller and uh, to interface to their robots. Okay, so our first slide, uh, this talks a little bit about the history of robots. Joseph Engelberger is uh, generally uh, credited with the uh, the creation of the first uh, robot, and uh, he formed a company in the in the 50s called Unimation, and the first robot was called uh, a Unimate. Uh, General Motors uh, was the first to deploy uh, the, ro the Unimate robot, and uh, they used it to remove die castings and uh, and for welding applications that were typically hostile environments to human workers. Uh, for those of you old enough, uh, including me, to remember Johnny Carson, the Unimate was actually um, uh, shown on uh, the Johnny Carson show, knocking a golf ball into a cup and then pouring a beer. The early robots were very expensive. Um, uh, the Unimate cost $35,000 in 1961. So just by way of reference, a dollar in 1961 is about $8 in, in, uh, in today's dollars. So uh, if you do the math, that's about $260,000 that a robot would cost um, uh, in today's dollars. So uh, very expensive, and obviously they've come down tremendously in price since then. Uh, early robots were very difficult to program. They were not integrated with sensor technology, either sensors or machine vision technology, but uh, through the incorporation of a lot of new technology in the 1980s, uh, robots saw tremendous growth and, uh, and then uh, had developed multi-axis robots with motors in the arms and, uh, to, to allow manipulation and movement. Uh, so here's a chart that shows uh, growth of uh, the robots uh, over the past several years. And, uh, you know, you see a dip in the 2009 time period corresponding to a slowdown in the economy. But ever since then, uh, the, the growth in robotic sales has been pretty strong, and there was an 8% growth in 2015. When you look at the geographical uh, uh, use of robots, uh, from a sheer number standpoint, China is one of the largest uh, users of robots, uh, followed by Japan, and then United States. Uh, now, again, these are um, say annual sales. The installed base in the United States is very, very large, though. And uh, interesting to note that 70% of robots are used in these five markets. If you look at uh, 2015 robotic sales by country, in North America, uh, there were 37,000 units, which was a 15% growth. The predominant share of that was in uh, uh, the United States. If you jump down to the bottom, you note that in a the Asia-Pacific marketplace, 
there were 156,000 units sold, so a little over four times the number that in North America, with China accounting for the largest number of those uh, sales, uh, just slightly less than half. When you look at the use of robots by uh, market segment or application, automotive and uh, electronics are the two largest segments. They have been historically and remain so. Um, uh, although in uh, 2015, there was a lot of growth in, in the use of uh, robots in the metals industry and plastic and rubber. Uh, electronics also, which was the second largest market segment, saw a pretty uh, uh, good growth as well. The, uh, uh, the analysts are projecting strong growth for robots in the years ahead, and um, uh, certainly we've seen that in the last few years as well. We're going to talk a little bit later about something called collaborative robots, uh, or cobots as they're nicknamed. Uh, collaborative robots are robots that are force limited, meaning that they're designed to work alongside humans. If you go back to one of the pictures that I had in one of the earlier slides, you saw a robot used in a caged area. That is a, a very typical use, particularly in the automotive uh, sector where that robot arm, if a human were there, it would not know that the human is there and could cause serious injury or even a fatality. But a collaborative robot is designed to be used alongside a human, and if it bumps up against a human, it would not cause an injury. So collaborative robots is a new uh, market area for robots and is seeing very strong uh, market growth. So moving on to the types of robots uh, that there are, um, the first type is what's called the SCARA robot. Uh, it, which stands for Selective Compliant Assembly Robotic Arm. And essentially these robots move in an X and Y direction but are rigid in the Z direction. And that's so their name means selectively compliant because of the motion that's involved with it. Uh, they are typically uh, have a circular uh, work envelope uh, used for assembly yeah. operations with low payloads. The most common uh, and what people typically associate with a robot is an articulated robot that can have between two and ten rotating joints. Uh, each joint uh, it can twist, called an axis, and uh, the most common types are in the four to six axis robots. Um, they can actually have uh, quite a large payload. Uh, Samir is going to talk about payloads on robots, but that is one of the a determining factors in the choice of robot is the payload that the robot is going to handle. So some, some typical uses of articulated robots is in welding, painting, palletizing, and then there are uh, clean room versions of, of articulated robots that are available as well and to work into environments where um, contaminants can't go into the environment. The next type is a Cartesian and gantry robot, which can move in the X, Y, and Z direction. Uh, you see a picture of, of one there. And then there's the cylindrical robot, which uh, has a, a cylindrical uh, work envelope. So the, the uh, robot arm can move around uh, in, in an axis, and then it can move also in the, uh, in the Y and Z direction. This next uh, type of robot is a very interesting looking one. It's, it's uh, called a delta robot. Look how it looks like a spider. And uh, the, uh, the joints up on top, uh, which are servo motors, can move their uh, high acceleration, uh, short cycle time movement. So it's used to uh, very quickly uh, uh, move, move the uh, arm over. And, uh, uh, and it's typically used for uh, uh, kitting type applications or picking a, a, a part off of a conveyor line, um, commonly used in the food, pharmaceutical, and elect electronics industries. A little bit later, Samir is going to show a really neat application uh, using a Delta robot. Um, while today we're really focusing on use of robots in the industrial automation space, it's worth noting that there are 
uses of robotics outside of industrial automation. Healthcare, uh, down in the lower right corner, is a, a company called Da Vinci. They are very uh, well known for surgical robots. Uh, robots are used in the police and military applications. Underwater explanation, the lower um, in the middle section is a picture of an under robot, underwater robot using space exploration. And most interesting uh, I found was uh, a lot of robots are actually moving into food service, and Samir will talk a little bit about that more as well. That's a, it's a new developing use of robots, uh, in a collaborative style robots. Okay, in addition to um, uh, this, uh, there are other technologies that are important in helping uh, the growth of robots. Uh, the first is uh, sensors and machine vision, which give guidance uh, to the robot arm and allow it to, to uh, identify parts, pick them up, uh, orient them correctly, and so forth. Uh, communications protocols that allow communications to uh, PLCs to communicate up the, up the food chain, if you will, to MES, ERP systems, uh, management reporting systems so that information uh, can be shared. And then the collaborative robots, as I mentioned earlier, these are force-limited robots designed to work alongside humans uh, so that if a, uh, a human uh, is, is, uh, touches a robot arm, no injury will occur. And typically these are for smaller batch type manufacturing applications. Uh, Indusoft, if you've been following us, we've been very active in the industrial Internet of Things uh, market. Uh, uh, IoT is um, um, essentially a, a, a marketing concept where uh, endpoint devices communicate with the rest of the enterprise so that information about what's going on in the endpoint can be communicated up and vice versa, and uh, so that information can flow back and forth uh, very quickly and efficiently, and it's really designed for high-mix, low-volume type applications. Well, that Internet of Things is also moving into the robotic space, um, and it's called the Internet of Robotic Things, where, again, this communication with the rest of the enterprise, uh, in addition to uh, working with sensors and actuators, uh, you know, to, to, to allow short, small-term uh, production cycles to occur by the robot. Okay, with that, Samir, I'm going to pass it over. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, robots, uh, especially the industrial robots. Um, so in the next few minutes, uh, I'd like to take you through, uh, you know, what is a typical industrial robot? I think John already talked about it, but get a little bit more into the details, specifications, performance. Then we'll talk about why use robots. Uh, some We'll see some applications, the industries the robots are used in. And uh, we'll also touch upon uh, systems integration. Uh, what, is, what are the steps you take to build a automated system using uh, industrial robots? And then a few minutes on trends in robotics. Numbers, I'll just breeze through that. Uh, John already touched upon that, but uh, also share with you a couple of uh, trade organizations that are that have been in business for a long time. There are many more organizations coming up, but uh, I'll give you contact information on a couple uh, that we work closely with. Uh, <clears throat> just a little background on uh, Kawasaki. Kawasaki Heavy Industries is our parent company. Kawasaki Robotics, uh, out of the Wixom office, is responsible for Americas, and uh, uh, the robotics division is part of one of the divisions of Kawasaki Heavy Industries called Precision Machinery, uh, which also makes hydraulic components like pumps, motors, valves, uh, you know, which are used in heavy equipment like uh, earth moving equipment, you know, in uh, drilling, dredging equipment, etc. And of course, we have uh, the aerospace division, uh, which builds aircraft components. In fact, uh, any Boeing aircraft you fly on uh, is probably uh, uh, has 
some structural components built by Kawasaki Aerospace. Uh, one recent example, the Dreamliner, uh, the flagship uh, airplane that's recently come out from Boeing, the carbon fiber uh, fuselage is built by Kawasaki. Rolling Stocks is another division that builds uh, the Shinkansen uh, or the bullet trains for uh, uh, high-speed transportation in Japan. Ships, offshore structures. About 138 years back is when Kawasaki started building ships. Uh, and we continue to build ships, submarines, uh, etc. Motorcycles, we see them, uh, you know, along with the other three major manufacturers from Japan, Kawasaki builds motorcycles, ATVs, jet skis. In fact, some of these are built in Lincoln, Nebraska, gas turbines for power generation, etc. cetera, uh, plant infrastructure, uh, tunnel boring machines, bridges, etc. So Kawasaki Heavy Industries is a pretty big company. Robot division is probably about 3 to 4% of their business. Uh, Kawasaki Robotics, out of uh, the uh, Wixom facility, is responsible for Americas. Uh, we sell Kawasaki robots. We integrate Kawasaki robots. We service, support, train our customers uh, all across Americas. Uh, about 1,000 employees across the Kawasaki uh, divisions. Uh, let's move into a typical industrial robot. I tell people an industrial robot is essentially a computer with an arm. And uh, it also has a teach pendant uh, for interacting, programming the the, the PC or, or the controller in the robot. And the definition, as you will see uh, in, in, in the academics as well as RIA, it's a reprogrammable multifunctional machine designed to manipulate material, parts, tools, specialized devices through variable program motions for performance of a variety of tasks. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you see a typical serial link uh, articulated robot. Uh, joint one, two, and three are called the primary joints or major joints. Joint one uh, has a vertical axis, joint two, horizontal axis, joint three, horizontal axis. Four, five, and six are also rotary joints, uh, and they form the wrist for that particular robot. Uh, on the right-hand bottom, you see uh, yellow, uh, the yellow spherical space. That is the workspace in which the robot can work. The mounting flange, the center point of the mounting flange can trace that spherical workspace, and that same workspace is depicted in that end view. You see the blue uh, space there. That is the workspace uh, of a 30-kilogram robot. And uh, John touched upon the history. I'll not go too deep into it, but 59 is when uh, Engelberger and DeWall started uh, building robots. 61, 69 is when GM started putting them in uh, automotive plants. 69 is when Kawasaki came to U.S. The licensing rights to build robots, Unimate robots for the Asian market. And since then, uh, we've been in business. Uh, we were the first, Kawasaki was the first to build electric robots in Japan. 74 is when first microcomputer was used to control a robot. And a fully electric robot was built in 1974. Uh, quickly, some of the key specifications and performance of a robot. Uh, what can a robot do? Essentially, a robot moves a load from one place to another or holds that force. How much, how much uh, uh, can it handle? That's very important. The payload, 30 kilograms, is one example. You, you have, today, you have robots ranging from 3 kilogram payload all the way to 1.5 ton capacity. Another question that comes to mind, how far can it reach from the vertical axis? And this example, 2,100 millimeters is how far it can reach in front of itself. Uh, repeatability, a big performance uh, uh, parameter. 
In this case, it shows plus or minus 0 0.07 millimeter. What does that mean? Uh, if you teach a point in space, a, the robot repeats itself to that point within plus or minus 0.7 millimeters, as long as it goes from the same direction to the point again and again. And of course, there are other specifications like the wrist load capacity, uh, moment maximum torque, moment inertia is when you get into selecting a robot, you need to look at some other important uh, uh, load parameters that um, you, you make sure you're within those load parameters. Uh, robot lineup, all manufacturers have robots ranging uh, uh, from really small capacity to very high capacity for different applications. The top row you see there um, is serial link robots uh, all the way from 3 kilogram to 80 kilogram. On the right end, right end you see the delta robots, uh, 3 kilogram capacity, 2 kilogram capacity. Uh, Z-series robot, next row, typically used in automotive manufacturing from 100 kilogram to 300 kilogram, different versions, floor mount robots, shelf mount robots. The M-series uh, are high payload capacity from 340 kilogram all the way to 1.5 ton capacity. And the last row shows paint robots, uh, majority of them being used in automotive painting to get the consistency, et cetera. Um, so uh, let's move on to uh, the controller itself. Um, as I mentioned, it's essentially a PC uh, drive controlling, uh, managing an ARM. Uh, it has a CPU, memory, etc. But it also needs to communicate to the peripheral devices, uh, including PLCs, sensors, etc. So you have options of using DeviceNet, CCLink, Profibus, Ethernet IP, which is very common in the US. Uh, of course, the traditional uh, terminal software through RS-232, uh, Ethernet, TCP, IP, et cetera. Um, typically, the base controller uh, will drive a six-axis robot, but the same controller, when you add some more hardware in there, uh, you can add more axes to control externally. Uh, <clears throat> let's look at why use robots. Uh, of course, productivity is very important. Uh, today, uh, some of the automotive plants put out one car every 35 to 40 seconds, something next to impossible to do without robots. Hard automation, we used to get to about, say, uh, you know, about 60, 70 seconds. Uh, quality, of course, uh, you want good finish, good quality, like in painting applications. Uh, robots are essential uh, to get you the paint quality that you need. Flexibility, you want to build multiple models. Example, again, automotive, you want to build uh, two or three different model cars. Robots give you the flexibility just by reprogramming or having multiple robot programs. You can, at the same station, you can handle uh, multiple car styles going through the system. Uh, minimize cost of production, labor rates are high in US, Japan, Germany. Um, hazardous environment applications, we'll see one application later on, a video of a hazardous application. Uh, some applications that just can't be done by humans. Of course, robots offer precision, consistency, repeatedly do the same thing again and again. Um, High labor rate environment, especially until recently, it used to be United States, Japan, Germany, England, France. Now the labor rates are going up in places like China, India, and other places like that. They have started using robots. Uh, applications and industries, almost across all industries, you will see robots being used. Initially, they started uh, getting deployed in automotive but now you see them in food, electronics, pharmaceutical, plastics, printing, publishing, agricultural machinery, construction machinery. John Deere's are using robots extensively for their manufacturing construction machinery like um, you know, earth moving equipment made by Caterpillar. Um, 
and examples of pharmaceutical applications, you know, where robots mix medication. Uh, I, I've heard of uh, uh, robotic pharmacies at the lower level in a hospital where a doctor upstairs placing, places a prescription. It goes to the robots. They, they mix the uh, uh, injection and, uh, or the medication, and it comes right to the floor and goes to the nurse. Uh, food and beverage uh, 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 is, is picking up with uh, robot manufacturers building food-grade robots. Electronics, we'll see some uh, a special robot uh, we've developed for electronics manufacturing later on. Uh, applications, material handling is one of the biggest areas. Uh, arc welding, spot welding in automotive, uh, every plant has body and wide application. You'd see 400 to 500 robots in a automotive plant for spot. some of them, 60, 70% doing spot welding applications. You have for material removal, polishing, uh, deburring applications, dispensing, uh, coating applications, which essentially is painting, you know, inspection applications, assembly applications. Uh, let's look at some applications. Uh, <clears throat> Here's an application, a very flexible application, where a 10 kilogram robot uh, is applying sealant to uh, gearboxes that are used uh, for robots. Uh, the robot picks up a uh, <clears throat> vision package, which is essentially lighting and a camera, uh, takes snapshots of the gearbox, which is sitting on a cart. The cart is just pushed into in front of the robot. Uh, so with the vision, uh, robot locates the exact position of the gearbox, sets the uh, vision package back on its stand, goes and picks up a uh, dispense nozzle, runs it by a, a cleaning pad, and now starts applying the sealant. It knows exactly where the gearbox is, and the uh, sealant path is pre-taught, so it locates the gearbox in space and starts applying the sealant. Now it's also used uh, to move the part away. Here's an application of a four-axis robot. It's a palletizing robot, 130-kilogram uh, capacity. It has a special adjustable servo-driven gripper. Goes and picks up uh, cardboard packs from the infeed conveyor and is building a stack. Um, this robot can build, can cycle as fast as about 28. Uh, times a minute. Again, the uh, adjustable gripper gives you the flexibility, you get the consistency, now it's placing a uh, slip sheet separating different layers. A hazardous application, uh, something next to impossible for humans to do at the rate at which the robots do this application. Uh, these are 30 kilogram robots. There are a total of four, four robots working around this forging press. This robot is loading a blank billet. Um, the two robots on the front and far side of the press, they move the slug from one cavity to the other and on the far side, there's a robot that picks the finished part and moves it out. These robots are taking the slug through a trimming station. Notice the dirty environment. The robots really close to the forging machine have a jacket, and it is cooled through compressed air vortex tube cooling. Let's move on to another application. Um, this is exterior painting of uh, automobiles. Uh, robots placed on um, stands, 
and um, there's a special conveyor tracking device with encoders uh, that is connected to the conveyor that is moving the car across, and those encoders are fed back to the robots for conveyor tracking the car as they are applying the paint. Once again, there's no way you can get the consistency you get out of uh, robot paint applications. Another application uh, which gives you tremendous flexibility, Kawasaki has this two robot cell uh, that is installing bearings in the motorcycle uh, gearbox. One robot picks up um, the jig, brings it over to the workstation. Uh, there's a camera that locates and, and also inspects the bearing, makes sure the right bearing is sitting on the jig. The second robot on the near side um, handles the bearing housing. It picks up the bearing housing, brings it over to the jig, um, gets pressed, the bearing is inserted, either while the robot is still handling the uh, bearing, moves over to the next bearing. Um, so by by having a hand in a number of uh, uh, jigs and the robot with a tool changer is able to handle different gearboxes for different motorcycles. A very interesting application, not really an industrial application, but an application where uh, a, a, the robot is handling parallel leaves. I, I, I guess these are pretty expensive leaves. Um, and uh, originally they were sorted out by uh, operators, but uh, now they're done with uh, by a Delta robot. What you see there uh, is the field of view of a uh, camera that looks at the orientation of the leaf, detects the position of the leaf on the conveyor, and also the size of the leaf, and passes that information to the robot. And the robot uh, picks up a leaf uh, conveyor tracking, and then picking up the leaf and sorting it out into um, sorting it, orienting it, and placing it on the exit conveyors as small, medium, large, extra large. And of course, it also counts the number of leaves that are stack that are on each stack. The Delta robot that you see there, uh, John talked about it. Uh, it's a very special robot for very high speed applications. You can do about 100, 120 picks per minute. And uh, the arms uh, are built out of carbon fiber to uh, minimize the inertias that uh, the motors are handling as it's uh, picking and placing. Quickly go through uh, the robotic systems integration process, the steps involved, uh, typically the automation uh, company will get a request for quotation, they will go out for fact finding, site visits, get drawings from the end user or from the potential customer, try and come back, uh, uh, put some specifications, define the project, they will try and concept the project from maybe a napkin sketch to some simulation work, uh, modeling and simulation work, with some technical interchange between the customer and the automation team. Uh, a proposal will be written. Uh, if it gets awarded, it moves into project planning. Designs take place, you know, and uh, this is not just mechanical design, it's mechanical design, electrical controls, programming, all that starts to happen. Uh, and the next step, is once the design is completed, partly completed, your procurement and build phase starts, assembly and testing happens. Um, controls robot programming can also start from design stage while assembly, well, well, while procurement assembly is happening, and the actual testing debug starts to happen once everything is assembled. 
runoff acceptance. Um, customer comes in to buy the system off, system teardown happens, install, it gets installed at the customer. Uh, documentation training is one of the most important things, uh, especially for uh, you know custom systems. Um, the, typically, the same team that did the programming goes out to do the commissioning work. And again, support is quite important as well uh, for custom systems. <clears throat> Quickly look at a few uh, uh, things that happen through the uh, integration process. As I mentioned, the initial concept uh, uh, process, uh, sales process as well. Uh, all robot manufacturers have simulation software, robot simulation softwares where you can model your uh, model parts, model peripheral devices, bring them into um, a, a cell, robotic cell, try, reach, try out the reach, uh, cycle time, et cetera. Um, and of course, there are third party simulation software companies as well out there. Um, and once you have all your design complete in the model simulation, uh, packages, you, you can start working on the design. So you have the cell layout, robot locations, conveyors that come over from dimensional details that come over from your simulation now start to move into softwares like SolidWorks, et cetera, for more details to be worked out. You design the end of arm tooling right down to the last uh, uh, you know, sensor, uh, et cetera. Safeties are very important. You know, where do I place my fencing, light curtains, muting devices, gate switches, 3D space definition. Most robot manufacturers now have special safety features, safety rated monitoring features where Kawasaki, we have a feature called cubic S where you can define cubic space and you can reduce the size and, and the robot will operate only in that cubic space. You can reduce the size of your, bring the fencing closer to the robot and uh, that way save on floor space, you know, the same. You can also define cubic spaces for uh, operator shared spaces, operator robot shared spaces. Electrical controls architecture design, you know, you do cycle time studies, sequence studies, uh, your PLC, uh, uh, design selection or drawings, etc., of electrical schematics. HMI, another very important aspect. Uh, John's going to be talking about how Indusoft interfaces to Kawasaki. Uh, you can build your HMIs using Indusoft for Kawasaki robots. We've already started using Indusoft on our uh, uh, Kawasaki integrated cells. You, you define your IOs, sensors that you need, including vision sensors for inspection or for guidance, et cetera. Your field buses, do you want to use device net? Do you want to use uh, Ethernet IP, et cetera? Uh, example of a cell that we uh, concepted years back for television uh, stampings. Uh, stampings come out, or stamping machines, one robot picks them up and places them in a exit stack. Uh, another robot picks up felt pads that separates these stampings so that they don't get damaged. Uh, the concept moves to a layout where uh, a layout engineer uh, places, puts dimensions to it and uh, passes it on to the people who uh, put all the peripheral devices together uh, for build and uh, uh, install phases. Some examples of uh, end of arm tooling on the left hand side top, you see a six cup vacuum gripper uh, that was designed to handle Pareto chip bags, you know, again, on a Delta robot handling up to 100 to 120 Pareto chip bags per minute, picking up from a feed conveyor, feeding the bags and, and building the little uh, matrix that you see there. On the right hand side is a gripper uh, designed in SolidWorks for picking up uh, aluminum engine blocks. Um, on the left bottom, you see a, a fork type gripper for picking up large uh, glass panels. Uh, some screenshots of uh, uh, the uh, teach pen and uh, panel, touch panels. 
Left-hand side, you see uh, the block step programming method. We'll touch base a little bit later on on this AS language, the advanced language uh, screens on the right-hand side, um, letter, letter logic for uh, internal P to pro program the internal PLC in a robot. Most of the robot manufacturers have this feature available. Kawasaki calls it K-Logic. Uh, you can build a small uh, uh, you can put 32, about 64 input, I put two robot systems using internal PLCs. A soft interface GUI, you can have, uh, you can, for a particular application, you can define uh, uh, push buttons, selector switches, um, you know, uh, indicator lamps, etc. that you can, uh, rather than use an expensive external device, you can build the soft interface HMI right on the teach pendant. Block step, as I mentioned, is typically used by uh, shop floor uh, employees who want to make small changes to programs. Uh, it's also extensively used for spot welding applications where uh, you bring, a, bring the robot to a point, uh, record the position, move it to another point, record another position, record to a third point, record that position, now run the robot. Uh, it goes from point one to point two to point three repeatedly. Uh, <clears throat> for advanced programming, for controls programming, for uh, building a system, typically uh, the robot programmers use AS language uh, for Kawasaki, which is essentially a text-based language. Uh, which also has motion commands in it. Uh, you'll see program control commands, motion commands, structure control commands, coordinate frame commands, and uh, you can build some really complex applications using the uh, advanced language like the AS language. Uh, let's move on to trends in robotics. Uh, collaborative robots, uh, John mentioned collaborative robots. Um, the picture on the top left is a uh, Kawasaki Duero, we call it a Duero. It's a two-arm Scala robot designed for uh, EMS manufacturing. Um, collaborative robots, uh, quick a little note on collaborative robots. Recently, uh, a new standard came out uh, by the number ISO 15066, uh, which defines essentially guidelines for using collaborative robots in the industries. It talks about four different important things, force and power uh, limitations, uh, safety rated monitored stops, safety and speed monitoring, and uh, uh, finally hand guided teaching. So anyone wanting to use collaborative robots uh, will typically use the ISO 15066 to be able to design a, and build a safe system. Medical surgical robots, uh, Da Vinci, John talked about it. I'll skip over that. Defense military robots, a big thing, a uh, big new area where uh, robots are being used. Domestic robots, I, I see uh, Roombas and uh, even um, uh, other manufacturers getting into Roomba type -like robots. Healthcare robots, uh, you'll see. Um, mobile robots in hospitals, moving equipment, moving medication from one location to another on the floors. Uh, space robots, we don't hear too much about it, but NASA is deep into space robots. Uh, originally, they started with Robonaut 2, now they're on Robonaut 5. It's used for human scale, uh, you know, it's a human scale humanoid robot. Uh, talking about using it for emergency spacewalks, it's kind of an extra pair of hands for astronauts. Uh, can also be used in the future for human explorations. A uh, little bit more about collaborative robots. What you see is, uh, a again, the Duero robot. Uh, it's designed to work together with people in the same space occupied by one person, it's deployed with minimum or no modifications to the assembly. The robot is uh, uh, modern on casters, and it can be moved from one application to another uh, for short production cycles. Uh, uh, this particular robot is designed for EMS or contract manufacturing in the electronics industry, where you could see 
changes in production runs about three times a day. Um, so to get you the flexibility and to be able to work next to the uh, uh, human operators, it's got the collaborative robot features built in. Uh, a quick note on IoT, again, all robot manufacturers working towards IoT. Kawasaki has a package called Trend Manager, which runs on a on the network PC, network PC uh, connected to the robots. Uh, it collects uh, the uh, trending information, and you can internal uh, service team can use that information, or if that information is available to Kawasaki. Uh, through different uh, 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 tools, Kawasaki can also help the customer directly uh, monitor the robots. One, one, one example of uh, uh, a parameter that is monitored uh, using trend monitor, current limiting values, you see that red line going from left to right on the top is defined by uh, past experience plus uh, some calculations and if, say for example, in this case, the joint one at some point uh, had, maybe there was a crash or something, and the uh, current on joint one starts to go up, at some point it is going to uh, be at a point where the, robot, the, the reduction unit is damaged. So by this kind of predictive analysis, you can be prepared with spare parts or, um, you know, change gearboxes, um, uh, during a downtime. Again, trends, all robot manufacturers starting to uh, build different types of robots, not just the six-axis robot, hybrid robots, servo locators. When you see a three-axis servo locator on the left-hand side, you could be using these locators in automotive for building you know, a sedan, a wagon, uh, or, or, or a coupe, um, et cetera. Uh, quick, I'll not go over the numbers. John also already talked about it. 2015 was a record year for uh, uh, robot units, 248,000 globally. And uh, uh, you have increases, 12% increase in the, from the previous year, 50%, uh, some 10% uh, uh, increase in Europe, 15% uh, increase in Americas and 16% increase in Asia's. And uh, you see the trend in the United States, it continues to grow. Uh, last year, 2015, revenue from robotics business was 1.6 billion, and it continues to grow. Uh, one thing to note, handling operations, machine training operations still continue to be the largest uh, uh, they occupy the largest a application area. That's because applications handling happens almost in every manufacturing. Welding, of course, spot welding takes a big uh, size of the application, especially because automotive spot welding. A couple of uh, uh, trade organizations, Robotics Industries Association out of Ann Arbor and International Federation of Robotics. Uh, if you need more information, these are the two areas to get in touch with. Robotics Industries Association has a very nice website. Um, and I'm not going to repeat this in the interest of time, but uh, by 2022, uh, the forecasting $79 billion of business across the globe. Um, so with that, uh, if anyone is interested in getting in getting more information about Kawasaki robots, Melanie Winkler is our account manager, channel partners. Please get in touch with her. Uh, she can uh, get you more information on our integrator program or get you in touch with the right salespeople. Um, and my information on the right-hand side, bottom, uh, if you want to get in touch with me. With that, I'll pass it back to John. Thank you for listening. Okay. Um, so, uh, again, thank you, Samir. I enjoyed the presentation. Uh, next, I'd like to touch on some of the features uh, that can be used in the IndieSoft 
software when used with the robotic application. For those of you that aren't uh, all that familiar with Indusoft, all of the features that I'm touching on here are included in our standard product. So uh, built into Indusoft, we have over 240 different drivers that communicate to most every type of PLC that's out there. Um, and uh, we've uh, developed, as we'll cover here in a second, uh, a driver specific to this Kawasaki uh, controllers as well. Built into the product, we have support for uh, the different uh, flavors of OPC. Uh, OPC DA is uh, the most commonly still used here in the United States and was the first one. OPC UA, uh, more widely deployed in, in, um, uh, in, in Europe, but uh, OPC UA, Unified Architecture, is uh, growing very rapidly here in uh, North America as well. Uh, recipe management, so you can preload configurations. Uh, the ability to access window files, text files, information for setup, alarming, event logging, building security so that you uh, can verify that it's only the proper person uh, uh, make some changes to the, uh, the HMI screen or control the PLC or the robot. Uh, we have ActiveX and .NET support uh, so that you can um, integrate uh, ActiveX or .NET controls to visualize uh, data from a vision system and embed that on the HMI screen. And last but not least is the support for uh, interaction with SQL compliant databases, whether it's Microsoft SQL Server, um, MySQL, Sybase, Oracle, whatever. Uh, now, specifically to the Kawasaki driver, um, again, this uh, developed uh, this this driver was developed uh, in partnership between Indusoft and Kawasaki, and it interfaces to the Kawasaki D and E series robot controllers. Um, as I understand it, the uh, the E controller is the current version, uh, but there is a, a very large install base of series D controllers. So this driver supports both controller types. Uh, it's a, uh, an Ethernet uh, TCP IP connection um, uh, to the controller, and we support the various headers that are here. Uh, strings, real, pose are uh, joint angular position variables, or in other words, the angle of the joint. The transformation position variable is the XYZ coordinate. Status signal, uh, data registers, and the where values, which are read-only uh, position, XYZ position values. Okay, so next what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Indusoft development environment. Now for those of you that aren't all that familiar with Indusoft Web Studio, let me just touch on uh, how drivers work. We have two types of driver sheets, and what we do in the driver worksheet is we associate in this column a tag, which is an Indusoft variable, to a, a PLC register that's defined in this field. And the station field is the IP address of the controller that I'm talking to. So I can either hard code the station address, such as uh, 192.168.1.10, .1 or I can make it a variable that I, I specify elsewhere and then I can change that if I'm communicating um, uh, to a different uh, uh, station. Um, so in the, in the I.O. address field, I put the register type and then the number of the register in this field. And uh, the, the, uh, uh, the main driver sheet triggers automatically and runs approximately every 600 milliseconds. So this data is being updated in here. And you notice in the, um, in the main driver sheet, um, I can mix the different register types. Now, I, I'm not actually connected to a robot controller, so right now I have this disabled. But if I was connected to a robot controller, I would not have that in, uh, disable bit set. Okay. In addition to the main driver sheet, we have standard driver sheets. And in the standard driver sheet, you connect to one uh, station at a time and one register type at a time. But the advantage of the standard driver sheets is you can trigger those faster or slower 
is the main driver sheet. So it can be a time-based triggering or it can be an event-based triggering of when you read that data. So um, there's, as you can see, there's a number of, of uh, uh, different uh, standard driver sheets that were developed in this sample application. Okay, so let me um, uh, close this and let's go run the application real quick. Okay, and the first screen that shows up is a plastic application. Uh, Kawasaki supports an SPI interface, which is a Society for Plastics Industry Standard Interface to connect to uh, uh, the robot and, and uh, the, the molding machine. Uh, the second application that, that we have here is uh, uh, interfacing to a welding robot and uh, again, displaying information for the operator to see. Okay, uh, with that, um, I think we're uh, pretty well done here and uh, what I want to do is uh, uh, put in here how you contact Indusoft and uh, open it up for uh, any questions uh, that, may, uh, that may come up. And I'm going to see if I can open up the uh, chat. Uh, the question came in, does Indusoft support any other brand of robotics? Uh, again, if, if, uh, if it supports, you can go to our website and look at the list of drivers and if there are other uh, drivers that the robot controller uses, then the answer would be yes. But um, you'd have to know what kind of uh, a protocol the robot controller would use. Yeah. Okay, the question is, does it support EtherCAT? Um, not 100% on that. I get, I, I would check our, on our website to make sure we support that. I know we support Ethernet IP. I'm not 100% sure about EtherCAT though, and uh, uh, there may be an OPC server that would support EtherCAT if we don't have a drive. Okay, well, it's, um, it's uh, 5 o'clock now, 4 o'clock Central. Um, I don't see any other questions uh, come in. Uh, with that, I think we'll conclude the webinar. I'd like to thank Samir for your presentation, and uh, please remember that we will put this recording on, uh, of the webinar on our website. Uh, for those of you that attended today, you'll receive a survey email, and we would greatly appreciate uh, any suggestions or comments that you have. And, um, and then if you fill out a survey, we'll send you a, a free T-shirt. So thank you, everyone, for your attendance today, and uh, have the great rest of your day.